I could go on to illustrate notes that explain substantive repairs to the transmitted text, or notes that indicate by a lacuna or a crux that the editor has despaired of repairing the text, or notes about punctuation, or orthography, or illegible codices, or the host of other issues that editors address in the critical apparatus. But the examples given so far suffice, I think, to show that the apparatus for a classical text is much more than a repository of variants. Its notes constitute a highly evolved form of philological argument. As I said before, the critical apparatus is a repository not of variants, but of arguments in the best sense of the word about variants. This form of philological argumentation may in fact be too highly evolved to move easily into the digital medium. Apparatus notes cannot simply be read. As we've seen, they have to be decoded, not only by the expansion of abbreviations and the filling of omissions in the interpretation of symbols. You see a particularly egregious example of cryptic apparatus language on the screen. But also with the help of concepts and theories that are presented elsewhere in the edition or in the scholarly literature. One of the major tasks facing the DLL in the field of classical philology more generally is to ensure that there are readers who can decode the critical apparatus. Only then will we be able to recode it for the digital future in a way that captures the arguments as well as the variants. I spend a fair amount of time working on just this task with my students at Penn. And to conclude, I'd like to show you the t-shirt that every member of one class wore to the final exam. It repurposes a Tacitian expression to capture perfectly my message about the importance of the critical apparatus for a classical text. Sine apparatu, sine honore. <laughs>